Today, we're going to talk specifically about wings. No, no, not those wings. Rear wings. Specifically, a drag wing, a rear spoiler, or what we have, which is called a big... Okay, the first thing you need to do before you pick out a rear wing is you need to figure out what car you're racing. Then you need to figure out a way to test it, a way to confirm that the stuff you're doing is going to work. The way we've done that with this car is we've 3D scanned the car, put it in CAD, modeled the car, and then ran it through CFD programs. Uh, the There are several ways to do testing, specifically with downforce. You could do a shock sensor, and you can calculate the, dra the downforce based on spring rate, motion ratio if necessary, and just see how much the shock travels at a given speed. Problem with testing that is too many variables, right? You've got wind direction, wind speed on the, the surface you're on, the grade of the surface, using the same surface at the same speed, the same condition, it's just, it's impossible to do it perfectly. Uh, that's why we chose to do the CFD route. Now it has its own problems. It is a computer program like anything else. It is crap in, crap out, so to speak, right? So everything that I'm gonna show you in this video is specifically stuff we did to get here, software we used, open source, pair view, a couple things, complicated stuff, it's a lot going on. My goal isn't to show you how to use the software, but more the process we went through and the results that we came to that let us choose the specific style rear wing, which you'll see at the end. Now that we've got our car, our style of testing we're going to do, what are we doing with our car? Is it a road race car? Is it a drag car? If it's a drag car, straight line car, what distance are we going? Eighth mile, quarter mile? We do half mile with this car currently. Are you going land speed racing where we're racing a mile or five miles, whichever? All of those are gonna greatly impact what you're trying to accomplish, which is also the next thing you gotta figure out. Are we looking for to reduce drag? Are we looking to increase downforce? Are we looking to leave downforce and drag alone and just increase stability with the car? All of these are gonna have an impact on which rear wing, rear spoiler, that kind of combination works best for your specific situation. Our initial results here were really interesting. The car with the factory rear spoiler on it actually made more downforce than the car did with the drag wing on it. Does that mean that the drag wing wasn't working? It actually doesn't. The drag wing was working, as you can see in this picture. See the color over the rear spoiler there. Black is low pressure area. Everything lighter, the lighter you get, the higher the pressure gets. And the color over the rear wing here shows that the rear wing was making downforce. So why did the car as a whole make less downforce? Check out the floor between this picture here of the car in factory form and this picture here of the car with the drag wing on it. What happened was the drag wing was reducing the drag amount, was reducing the low pressure area behind the car. It was allowing the air to better fill the void created by the car as it moves through the air. As a result of that, the airspeed under the car was diminished. This car specifically has a flat floor because the airspeed under the car was diminished, the low pressure area under the car was diminished, thus the downforce as a whole, or the whole vehicle, was actually less with the drag wing on it. When At one point, we had lost the drag wing. It, it collapsed. We had a 200 and saw so it a 16 mile an hour, something around there. The wing actually gave up. It bent the wing struts. What was an interesting thing about that is my wife driving the car had no idea. It took me a long time to figure it out. And until I did the CFD testing, I had no, I didn't understand what was happening. The wing was actually not doing really anything to the car as a whole. The wing itself worked, but its effect on the whole project was not the direction we wanted to go. It was actually creating about 80 pounds of lift at 200 miles an hour. The car with the factory rear spoiler on it made about 20 pounds of downforce at the same speed. A very interesting kind of deal there. The next step we started playing with was trying to make the drag wing work better. We put this big rear wicker on it. We put these skirts on it. We put a little air dam on it. We were able to make downforce with the wing, not a significant amount, around 160 at 200 miles an hour, which was almost double what it was making. Actually, double what it was making with the factory spoiler around. It was way more than what it was making with the drag wing before all the, the air dam and the skirts and the big wicker and whatever. And the drag numbers were starting to creep up there. And as a result of downforce, there's always drag. There's just no way to avoid that. So you're trying to make it efficiently. Well, what? that's when we started trying the touring car style rear wing. You'll see in this picture here with that rear wing on it, how the wake is shaped behind the car, the pressure, the air over the car from the roof line curves up at the wing. You can see the thing working very well. Now this combination ended up making 
because it's variable angle, right? So at a relatively low angle, it made as much downforce as the drag wing did, but at less drag numbers by about 3%, which was great. So the next step was, well, okay, let's see how much downforce we can make with this thing. And we started playing with different rear fuser designs, again, different air dam, skirts, no skirts, a bunch of combination of things. We were actually able to make quite a bit of downforce, about 800 pounds at 200 miles an hour, which for that thing was pretty cool. The problem with that is it was relatively efficient, but the issue was we didn't need to make 800 pounds of downforce not with the drag penalty that we were getting from that. So we picked a happy medium. That happy medium showed us a range, depending on the wing angle, of about 200 pounds of downforce at zero degrees at 200 miles an hour, up to about 1,300 pounds of downforce with the wing cranked all the way up, and which is something we were never intending to do, but uh, was a combination. The big issue we run into with this car or with this style of thing, again, back to what we're doing for motorsport, what our demographic is, what style of racing we're doing, sorry, is we need the car to hook up up front. We also need it to hook up up top. So we're using the suspension geometry and the shocks and the springs and all that stuff to make the car leave the starting line and work well up front. And then we're using the arrow to make the car work well up top combined with the suspension. Now that creates an issue in spring rate. That issue is that if you're gonna make a bunch of downforce, you've gotta have enough spring to hold the car up. If you don't have enough spring to hold the car up, the car is just gonna drive down. We actually did that. I had five degrees in the wing and we had a 150 pound, I think, rear spring in the car at the time. And at 200 mile an hour, it was kind of scary. Here's a picture. Notice the ride height is going the wrong direction, meaning the back of the car is starting to become lower than the front of the car. So. For us, for anybody that's racing a car, that is a huge detriment. That means the whole car is about to fly. It's going to become a wing. At some point, it's going to create more lift than the car weighs, and it's going to become airborne. That's why testing this stuff is very critical. Having the right data, having an idea of what you're doing, knowing the right approach is crucial. So we, the only option we had is to put more rear spring in it. Well, we put more rear spring in it, and then we couldn't get the car to leave like we wanted. It's just a combination here, right? So what we ended up settling is we ended up with a 300 pound rear spring and we ran the wing static, zero degrees of angle. And then at, when, at static, right? So ride height is dynamic because the ride height changes in the back. The car was still squatting with that 300 pound spring. So you got to measure wing angle static, knowing that it's going to change at speed. And what would happen is it made about 730 pounds of downforce at 230 miles an hour based on the shock travel sensor. The cool thing about that is my CFD data, the results we got from Paraview doing all the calculations after we ran the simulations in open foam, showed the entire car with that wing setting making around 1,000 pounds of downforce. So it's not too terribly far off, it's pretty far, 30%. But we're only calculating the downforce on the back of the car at the rear shock. The front of this car has a travel limiter to keep the nose down. And it's on the travel limiter the majority of the time at the end of the track, it just started coming off the travel limiter, meaning that it was starting to compress the front of the car more and more the faster it went. That's huge because it means the front of the car was actually making downforce instead of where we were before the spring change and the wing angle change where it was trying to take off. So lots of stuff there. Anyway, this rear wing thing, it's all about what you're doing. The drag wing did make the least amount of drag but it was not good at making downforce. As soon as we started making downforce with it, it started to make a lot of drag. It just wasn't gonna work. So in our specific application, the traditional style, what touring car or whatever you wanna call the rear wing like we have, it was the best and is the best option for us. Now that is very car specific. If you have a different car, say you've got a Corvette or say you've got a whatever, a Miata or anything with a different shape, how the floor affects the air, the whole package here is what's important. So it may be a scenario where a drag wing on a different body car, a different ride height, whatever, would work really well. The other thing we did is we played with a really large diffuser, changed the diffuser within the confines of what I was able to fabricate on the car, and we made a bunch of downforce that way. The other problem with using the floor in this specific, again, this application to make a bunch of downforce, is that it's very ride height dependent. The further away from the ground it is, the less efficient the floor becomes. So some of the tracks we go to, they're all airports. Some of them, specifically the one we race at the most of the time in Marion, Indiana, has a very big bump at the very top end of the track, 230 mile an hour, 
we saw 2G of vertical load over that bump. That's how significant the bump is. I also saw 22 mile an hour, 23 mile an hour where the wheel speed over the bump too, which is terrifying. But you got to keep that in mind too. If the car's ride height is very dynamic or the surface you're racing on is all over the place, that relying on the floor heavily to create all the downforce, suddenly you go over a bump and the ride height changes an inch, half an inch, three inches, whatever it may be, that affects the downforce over the whole vehicle. So having the floor be relatively simple, not as sensitive to ride height changes, and the rear wing making the most of our downforce in the back of the car, and the splitter and the air dam working together on the front of the car to keep it happy there was our best option we've come up with to do this date on this car. Everybody's situation would be different. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope you took something away from it. Again, these are just all our results. Not everything will carry over, but it's uh, been a fun project and I just wanted to share it. Looks like we got Jessica Hassing right here, right now. 224 miles an hour, I believe, is her new record. Go. What's it going to be? Two hundred thirty point six five miles an hour. Woo! Jessica Hassig sets the bar high. Oh my goodness! <laughs>